Julie Book um, is one of the foremost land artists working in, in Britain and, and in the world today. She's a filmmaker, a draftswoman, but mainly she works with the materials of land, with stone and wood and the rocks of a quarry. She works on the grand scale, making her lines through a, by changing the course of a riverbed, but she also works on a very intimate scale in terms of close tactile uh, engagement and long, patient watching. So, welcome. Thank you so much, <laughs> Alexandra. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to be with you. One piece of work which you're coming back and back and back to, it's building up uh, into a panoply, uh, is the Firestacks series. And since we're here by the fireside, can we start there and have yes. a and have to think actually about um, where it came from in the in the first instance. Um, I mean, we're now um, every season seeing you building these cairns in the same place each each season, um, and you're doing it for really a few years now. Yes, Is yeah, there yes, an end few... point and, and was there a starting yes. point? The starting point was actually in 1992 when I was living on the west side of Jura, in an uninhabited part of the island of Jura, up on the west coast of Scotland. And I first conceived of this work really as, as the beginning of my sculptural work as well. I was living in a natural arch, I was collecting my water every day, making fires every day to cook on. And after doing a bit of functional building in the arch to make it more habitable, I wanted to use those skills and that sensibility to make work. I was painting outside in the landscape and I had wanted to go there to see what would happen unlooked over, as it were, unseen. Because I was working with all the elements every day, I thought, wow, well, what, what if I tried to bring the elements together? It was a very simple premise at the beginning. During those early times in Jura, I recognised I needed to use a film camera, a cine camera, because of it being such a transient um, piece of work and that it was, in, it was a work always in movement. I'm very intrigued by this sense of the work coming out of your daily survival there. Yes. I mean, in a, in a way, surely, in order to survive, you've got all this hard work of keeping the water off the fire yes. and making sure the logs aren't damp. Yes. And then for you to want to make this great sort of dramatic work of art in which the fire is quenched, mm. is that somehow, is that a reflection on the ordinariness or is it apart from it somehow? I was really loving living there and living in that solitude and I wanted to find a, a more direct form of expression to say something about that that was different from the arduous journey of painting. It was so exciting making the arch more habitable and the ease with which I've always built that I thought, well, I, how can I harness that energy? It's such an ease in me. It's, it's, it's actually very different from the painting energy. How can I take that energy and that um, zest and put it into a non-functional work? So when I began them, I recognised both the authenticity of the language of, of it, because it felt so true to how I was living, but also it was leaving the function of, of the other building I'd done. It was, it was of itself. That was its own function. And it didn't lead anywhere. It is simply what it was. And that, to me, was like opening this wide, exciting door. Then I went off and did lots of other landscape works, you know, different drawing on that energy, but then finding different ways to realign myself with different landscapes. And then in 2016, I was asked to... Um, be involved in the BBC documentary and to, to re-engage with the fast at work. And in the process of doing that, I recognised that this particular tidal work was so much more than bringing the four elements together. It, it was even more profoundly about these invisible forces of gravity and actually that notion of, 
of choreographing time, really. But while we're still on these four elements, let's just, I mean, lay out the basics of what's happening in terms of the elements. Yes. Here. I mean, I suppose the, 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 the fire and the water are the celebrity elements here. They have the headline, don't they? But all the time we're watching the sky change, the air move, the fire. Yes. Are, are you constantly looking for that interplay? Yes. And in a sense, what the essence of the work is so with that there was a clarity to bring the four elements together but for instance in my frankly more in-depth study because i'm now working with sound as well mm. and also very deliberately working through different seasons but will there be one winter which somehow embodies the winter fire stack and but hopefully okay okay hopefully and so what would that mean for you for for a film to be to represent winter well, it's going to be subject to that moment in time. Yeah. But you know how winter has a very particular quality, quality of light, quality of change of light, quality of temperature and, um, in a sense, precariousness with the weather. Mm. You know, these short days, this relationship with the darkness, the sense that we don't quite have enough time of light mm. in the winter. Mm. We're challenged by the cold. We're really challenged by the winds and, and by hail and by rain. And I might get a very calm day in winter, but can that calm day feel different from a calm day in summer? camera people we're like the prison through which you're then going to experience that particular day and that particular firing but hopefully with it with beyond the specific nature of that you're going to, to experience the seasonal difference as well of course it makes me th me think that the wind um is one of the the, our languages for recognizing a place isn't it and we're not yes. even sure always in what we can read the wind where is it legible yes in, in your fire stacks it's legible in the movement of water air is air is legible through water and through fire yes it's really wonderful you bring up wind because some days one element predominates over another so one firing it can actually be all about the wind the way it's scribbling across the sea, mm. the way it's pushing the smoke, the way the smoke is describing the wind and, and the air spaces. Another time it's been the light, another time it's been the stone, and I can't really describe why, because the stone is the most static form in, unless it falls. But just particularly one firing, um, it was quite rough, but one felt the presence of these you know, knitted together stones that, that both have a strength, an apparent strength to them, but also a fragility because they can't possibly compete with the swell of the ocean. Mm. And I find those tensions very exciting and that I think that's where I've explored the depth that I wasn't able to in the, in the initial excitement of Jura. Um, so when the elements tease themselves out and become the more predominant one singing within that particular mm. film and also going underwater as well that's mm. been a because we've experimented a lot with sound underwater as well I have a really wonderful sound artist I work with and that created a whole um, spatial dimension to watching the films mm. because in real life you don't hear the underwater sound Absolutely. you know at the time <coughs> occurred to me on first watching or even on some of the more reflective subsequent watching that what I was hearing was not at all what I could see that yeah. the, the sound was not correlated with my 
perceptive position. Yes. But that was nevertheless somehow translating or transliterating yes. experience. So in, interestingly, the, the sound is probably more crafted in the edit mm. even than the picture. I was thinking recently what makes up a season and of course whether it's only one of the constituents of it so I think yes at the moment we're all trying to recalibrate what a season might be we're sitting here in May by the by the by fire. fire yes exactly. <laughs> um, and unseasonality is clearly part of what it is to be alive in the 21st century and uh, yeah. um, and in a way you're pulling us back into a kind of cardinal sense of north south east west and the four seasons. Yes. And yet I love this sense that some of them are not behaving as they should. But at the same time, of course, it is that season because the stars are in the place. And yes. the tide is working according to that season. Exactly. Exactly. You would begin to sort of experience the seasons on a more visceral level. Um, and not saying, well, is that is that autumn or is that winter? Rather than that mind way, I think you would, you would experience it in a sort of more bodily intuition as we do when we experience them literally, you know, around in our everyday life. Yeah. Um, because you're not, with these, you're not looking at trees and the leaves or mm. the plants mm. or, you know, in the way that we might, in the conventional way in which we watch spring unfurling or... Um, but it does suggest some of the things that we can learn in your work and carry over into the way we walk around Birmingham or, or Leeds yeah. in that... Things like noticing how quickly the sun sets. Absolutely. And <laughs> how light... So, for instance, in, in the autumn, our dusks, particularly up north, are actually very long. And they're not yeah. nearly as long in the summer. Yeah. And so... But I learnt that from that filming in November. I don't think I knew that properly by observation. And I... You know, you see it on a film. It's absolutely staggering. Um because we all know those twilights, you know, those in-between lights are so exquisite. That relationship of light falling and tide rising gives you a very powerful sense of the pull of the moon and that, that mm. rather abstract sense of gravity. light seasons um, how these things affect really profound decisions in our work and in this case you know I conceived of it but in fact I've now been living the evolution of that it, it, it's taken a course that's much less um, clear-cut than than I think I imagined in my mind you know no, I'm very excited to see it. And it is a kind of contemporary almanac, I think. I mean, I'm, yes. I'm immersed in medieval almanacs at the moment, which tell me a great deal about those those cosmic movements yes. that actually can be very hard to, to feel. Yes. Um, but well, once one have... learn, has that literacy from the kind of films that you make, I think one can start to feel it. You start looking, and it's hard. It's hard to watch a tide coming in. Yeah. It's hard to watch light falling when there's no focal point but when you have a, a focal point or if you're taking a walk down a beach and watching it falling you're then experiencing that and of mm. course as soon as we turn on electric lights um, we've lost that relationship of subtlety yeah one last question in this little mm. segment here is about how you see the relationship between the flame that you've made and the sun Yes. You've got two fires in this picture, right? Yes. And, and your camera is moving to change their relationship. It just yeah. makes me think it's what it's what Claude and Turner are dealing with. And how do I look straight into the sun and make that my subject yeah. without being blinded? And it's that contradiction yes. all the time. But can you just say a little bit about how you're almost choreographing your flame with yes. the sun? I remember one firing we had during that period when 
it was you literally felt it before you saw it but there was this incredible reddening in the light mm. and it was before there was a reddening in the sky it felt like a weight in the air you might be lucky to get an, a sensation of that on film or it's something you may just accept that it's just an experience mm. 